Thank you. So greetings and a very warm welcome to all the panelists and the participants. Uh, my name is Sanjeev Ahuja. I am founder of Missing Bridge, a mediation and a negotiation platform. So along with the team at CAMP, which stands for Center for Advanced Mediation Practice, we bring the much awaited session to decode the Mediation Bill 2023, which was recently passed by the Indian Parliament. And it's just waiting for the President's nod. Now, to help us understand the highlighting features, the good and not so good aspects of this bill, uh, and the impact it would have on the judicial system in particular, and with regards to dispute resolution in our society in general. We have today with us Mr. Shiram Panchu. He's a senior advocate and a renowned mediator, aptly referred to as uh, Bhishma Pitame of Mediation. Uh, we have Ms. Uh, Laila Olipoli. She is senior advocate and founder of CAMP. Uh, and of course, to ask uh, the views, opinions, comments, and suggestions, we have Mr. Jawad, who's an advocate and a senior mediator. So with this, I leave the session in the safe hands of Jawad and request him to take this session forward. And I surely would be around to share my perspective as a mediator come resolution professional as and when it is desired. Thank you. What are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. And thank you, everyone for joining today. Uh, we have two of the biggest names in mediation uh, who are going to give their take on the Mediation Act, which has been recently passed by both houses of parliament. So I, without wasting any time, let me straight away get to the questions. Uh, my first question is to Mr. Sriram Pachu, sir. I understand that your throat is very bad, but uh, as briefly as possible. Yeah, uh, and can we mute? Uh, Anubhav, can we mute some Narayan and Ranganathan? Yes. So, how do you rate the Mediation Act, sir? And uh, what do you think would be the effect of this uh, legislation on the current justice delivery system, especially from the perspective of access to justice for people? Well, uh, firstly, thank you for having me here. And I think Sanjeev, now, now that we have a Mediation Act, uh, the bridge is so I can apply to Sanjeev, but not to me. Uh, I am just a maverick. Uh, I'm your maverick. Or, or the Doyen also. Uh, we can take a vote on that. I'm not sure you will. We'll see. Uh, but let's get to Jawad's uh, question. Um, I rated five out of ten. Um, for reasons I'll explain, it could have been nine out of ten, or it could have been a perfect ten out of ten. It was within sight. But I rated five out of ten, which means it's just got the pass mark. So why do I give it uh, five five marks? Firstly, the fact somebody's noise coming in. I think camp arbitration and mediation. Can you just... can't, can't you can't you just mute yeah, that's, everybody? That's else? what we're trying to do, sir. Yes, we'll do that. Um, firstly, the fact that an act has been passed, I think, is a big thing uh, because it is a standalone act on mediation, and it's recognition of the fact that mediation has arrived and it's taking its place in the dispute resolution landscape. So point number one, that an act has been passed. Secondly, that the act provides for institutions, uh, a mediation council, um, but also mediation service providers and mediation training institutes. Thirdly, that the act begins the process of professionalizing mediation. Uh, by giving parties the choice of mediators, by evolving a code of ethics, by accreditation. So the movement to professionalize the, uh, the mediation profession, the, the, the mediation uh, team as a profession has started. And I think that is very, very significant. Fourthly, the Act you know, gives the mediation agreement the status of a decree of court. Uh, and I think that's also significant because it's a little, it's a, it's a cut higher than arbitration. And if people ask, you know, uh, does this mediation really effective? All we have to say, look, it's as good as a degree of court. 
Um, fifthly, I think the act uh, has not caged mediation. You know, it's, it's a difficult task to legislate on something and not cage it. But I think the act has managed to avoid caging it while structuring it. So these are my five plus points. On the minus side, I think the Mediation Council of India is badly uh, uh, composed, not very well composed. It just has a chairperson, one teacher of mediation and one person in mediation law. Where, where, are the, where are the practitioners? You know, this is a professional practice. Where are, where are the profession? Where are the practitioners on the Mediation Council? That's a serious lack. The first schedule is enormously long. It need not be so long. You know, why can't telecom disputes, why not electricity, why not, you know, those kind of disputes be mediated? The exclusion of government disputes is again very disappointing. They only included commercial disputes with government. There are so many other disputes with government which can be mediated. Um, so that is a big disappointment. The first schedule, the council, the, you know, the exclusion of uh, government. Um, there are some complete... Uh, and the, the, the way they provided for compounding, you know, the first schedule excludes compoundable criminal offenses. But another section, I think six or seven, tries to bring it out in a kind of a, you know, awkward way. And then they messed up on the uh, pre-litigation mediation. And they have kind of, you know, put in such caveats, may voluntarily both consent, etc which makes it very loose, you know, teeth, toothless. Relitigation, you should be telling people, look here, go try and sit and mediate. Just have two sessions, one session, but you must do it. It doesn't provide it that way. So it's, that's why it doesn't get the balance five marks. I mean, you know, it is such a pity. Mediation is not rocket science. We could have got a perfect act. Uh, and it's sad that we missed it. Plus, Singapore Convention, no mention. Uh, although I hope they will bring it in at least in another legislation. So this is the uh, this is this where we are. I think pass marks, five good, five not so good ones. I think I'll take a break now. Okay, sir. Uh, Laila, would you like to add? Anything? I, I want to show off. I want to show off my cup, please. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. This yes. is the symbol of my school. I don't know about public school, and it says, be vigilant. Because <laughs> I think what we need in these times, this is the constitution of India. And this is the preamble, justice, equality, liberty, and fraternity. I just want to show off this cup. All mediators who are nice to me will receive a cup. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm lucky to get one already. Yeah. So uh, be vigilant. I think that's that's very important considering the slew of legislations that have come. Sorry, sorry. Some, somebody left a stupid phone over here. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Laila, would you like to add anything to what Mr. Panchu has said about the Act? Because particularly from the perspective of uh, access to justice and its impact on the justice delivery system of India. Um. <laughs> Thanks everybody for having me here and Sriram, it's a privilege to hear you on this and I think you've covered so many good points. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, I'm always an optimist. If Sriram gives five, I'd like to give six. <laughs> uh, because I, I believe that, you know, you see so many legislations nowadays with so many goofs. And comparatively, this has come out well. Uh, lots more to do, long way to go. And I'm happy they have, uh, the legislation has covered many spaces. So whether it's civil, commercial, government, in a, the, the step has been taken, uh, consumer. So in many spaces, mediation, the, the buzzword can happen. And similarly, the definition of mediate, mediator has included conciliation. It's again a very wide uh, uh, definition, media, as Srira mentioned, mediation service providers, ad hoc mediators. So there, there, 
there has been an expansion in the spaces it covers. Um, it has provided for confidentiality, self-determination, voluntariness in a fairly tight way. There are still some more to go. And if you ask me about the impact on the justice delivery system, I believe it will depend a lot on two things. One, how the judges will embrace mediation. Will they be able to decentralize justice delivery? Will they be able to accept mediation as an integral part of the justice delivery system? We have to recognize that the courts are the reservoirs of disputes. And they have a position of authority and uh, respect of the litigants. So if they become champions for this legislation, if they undertake the responsibility to disseminate what is possible under this legislation, at the same time, believing that their role is adjudication, leave the mediation to the mediation community. So it's a paradox and they need to work with both. So how, how do the judges allow the implementation of this process? Secondly, how good would our services, the mediation community, how well can we deliver our services? Because mediation is self-determination. The parties are free to leave anytime. And unless our services are of a superior quality, we cannot keep them in. So uh, if this happens, if there is a holistic approach to justice delivery, and if the mediation community takes it on as a commitment to good services, I believe the justice delivery system can be uh, definitely helped and the creases can be ironed out if we work towards it. So thank you, Laila. I think you made two very important points. One is the acceptance by the judges, but I would extend it a little further and say, I think it's more important for the lawyers also to embrace mediation because they should not think that, you know, there's somehow this belief that has come that justice is only what is delivered by the courts. So my simple question is, why can't I do justice to myself by resolving my problems through a collaborative process and solve my problems? So that is an important question. I think that uh, the lawyers need to ask themselves, are they problem solvers or are they problem inflamers? My experience, uh, Javad, has been that if the judges are persuasive enough, yes. if, the, if the mediators have the skills to help the lawyers feel that they are an important part of this problem solving, my experience has been they, they do take the process very well. Yes. And we have we have witnessed a lot of change from what where we were earlier. Yeah, absolutely. So my, my next question is again to you, Laila. Uh, Javar, may I come in, please? Yes, sir. I have a point um, from what Ayla said. Yeah. You know, I think the whole idea of this act is to make us non-dependent on judges. I'm, I'm making a point boldly. We were very dependent on judges in the initiation of mediation and to propel it and to start it. We were very dependent on them. But I think we must seize our dependence on the judges. And I think in place of that, we must substitute ourselves as champions. We must do that in different ways. We must build up, of course, judges should help, of course they will. But we must build up this culture of mediation. We must popularize it by our writings, by our talks, and most important, by the effective manner in which we conduct mediations. And we must up our own capacities. You see, we, let me be very frank. We have been in this, you know, like this pro bono, court alleged, honorarium business. 
which doesn't demand quality. And where work comes to you automatically because you're on a roster. No more. If you want to succeed in the professional practice of mediation, you have to prove yourself in the market. You have to be sought after because you are trusted and you're competent and you're efficient. That's the only way you can succeed in the market. Please understand this is a fundamentally different ball game. This is now not socialism where, you know, court will give you cases whether you're good or bad. This is now a market which will judge you by performance. And I think we are now in the driver's seat. Whether the car goes off the road and into the ditch and doesn't progress like arbitration, or whether it goes on the highway is entirely up to us. Yeah. Can I add to that, Java, uh, with your kind permission? Sriram, I, I, I totally agree. Um, at the same time, I think when one is in private mediation, the fact that there are two lawyers who are reluctant and two parties who are reluctant makes it very difficult to, con especially in the context of a voluntary mediation, makes it very difficult to promote mediation. I mean, this is something which world over, there is a realization. And therefore, the push by the judges is important. And why I say that is once they experience a good mediation, once parties and lawyers experience a good mediation, they, they come back to it. But otherwise, you can talk and talk and they don't understand it. It is against the intuitive um, impulse of a human being to collaborate when there is conflict. But if a judge says it, it's much easier. I, I, and to give you a simple example, in 2011, I was in a San Francisco, San Francisco court hall. 60 cases came up for mediation. I was part of a delegation that went from the Karnataka High Court. 60 came up, cases came up. The judge referred 52 for mediation. The remaining eight, he sent some for arbitration, some for judicial settlement. At 10 o'clock in the morning, he came and had coffee with us and said he has four cases left for the day. And he was confident that 60% of the cases that he referred for mediation would be resolved. He did use persuasion. If we are not having a mandatory mediation, the judge's persuasion would be an important factor. These are my thoughts on it. Yeah, see, I, I don't see any divergence of opinion here. How I see it is that uh, we are talking about two concepts. One is the court annex mediation and the other is private mediation. So I think the point that Mr. Panchu is making is that uh, as far as private mediation is concerned, uh, the act is setting the stage for professionalizing mediation so that we ensure the best quality of service to people so that even without being told by the court, please go for mediation, people should choose mediation as an option. Oh, sorry, Jawad. I, saw, I have one more point. Yes. Huh. Saying we should professionalize it in such a way yeah. that even in matters in court, the parties and the lawyers and the judges say, let's do mediation first. Exactly. Yeah. It need not come only from the court. No, it, it need not come from, it come from parties. Exactly. It need come from lawyers. Yes, yes. And that's what we have to work towards. Yes. Absolutely. Not, I'm sorry, but not these things, you know, hand out from the bench. Uh, uh, um, Sri Ram, in, back to my Sri, San Francisco case, the judge did not say go to court annex program. The judge only exactly. said go to, go to mediation. mediation. Go to mediation. Yeah, that's it. No, and look, the act has made one thing very nicely. Huh? It has said yeah. first choice of, of mediator is by parties. Yeah. Reference by court to court and next mediation is only last choice. Exactly. Yeah. First choice is parties choosing their own mediator. We were very insistent on that. So that is a hallmark of professionalism. Yes. Parties choose their mediator, pay for the mediator. 
ിയുടെ <laughs> Uh, so what is what is your view on that that it is made voluntary now and not mandatory how do you think it is going to affect the uh, you know generally the 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 the, the, uh, the idea of spreading the concept of mediation um i am a great believer in mandatory mediation provided it is done well it is the voluntariness should not be taken away and here there is a i think we need to see a distinction between entry and participation in the act court's judgment the supreme court said the parties can be ordered to go in for mediation and what is that order enter it is at the entry point today willingness of the parties may not be there and why for several reasons it can be the ego of parties it can be ignorance they don't know what mediation is it can be an escalation of the conflict but in the hands of a good mediator these can be the veracity of the willingness can be tested is it the really their willingness that prevents them or is it other issues that is preventing the willingness a good so the quality of the mediator once the mediator is somebody who can convince the parties very quickly that this the mediator has no authority to impose a decision he can build communication he demonstrates or he or she demonstrates the neutrality and the the skills involved in self determination parties will come out with the truth so i do believe mandatory is good for the entry but for participation it should be willingness and sometimes i wonder if this section was removed because there was a confusion on what is voluntary or not if that was a reason or even the italian example that like even the uh, i think it's romania they are struggling with the mandatory because they didn't put the systems in place the mediator capacity <clears throat> is very important so i think that is one of the challenges in india also do we have the systems in place if it is made mandatory so would you like to add something to that yeah. sir i am going, going i am going i am going to display my maverick qualities 
Go ahead, Zira. I, I am not unhappy that mandatory mediation has been reduced to nothingness. Because I think mandatory mediation is a crutch. Mandatory mediation is like pushing the horse to the pond and asking it to take a couple of sips from the pond and then seeing you like it or not. Without mandatory mediation, the horse is not at the edge of the pond, but the pond is within sight of the horse. It is our job to make that pond visible, to make it clear water, to make it bright, to make it invite. Then the bloody horse will walk to the pond on its own. We can manage quite well. We, all we have to do is to build up a culture of mediation, spread success stories, infuse people, better our performance. Word will go around that, okay, look, we need to try this. And let me add one point, you know, this sounds mercenary. But we must tell our lawyer colleagues one thing, and this is what I told some committee recently of judges. I said, look, I said, you know, please understand that in mediation, the fee uh, structure for lawyers has to be different. We are all used to a per hearing fee structure. This disadvantages lawyers in mediation because you just take a few sessions and you close the whole case. I said, we have to start encouraging lawyers like what is being done abroad. When there is a big commercial matter abroad, the CEO of the company will sit with the head of the law firm and say, look, what does it cost? If you took me to trial, what will it cost you? And let's say that the law firm says, well, it's going to cost you $100 million. Whatever number, 100. The CEO says, all right, if you get me a good settlement, I'll give you 33. Now look, it makes damn good sense for the CEO. He's finished off the whole thing and his legal fees are only 33. It makes damn good sense for the lawyer. That case to trial will take him 10 years. Here he's going to get one third right up there within a couple of months. It's good for the client. He's going to see a good settlement. So we have to start, you know, incentivizing lawyers, not just by telling them, look here, you know, be good boys, mediation is a good thing. You know, Allah or Rama or Christ will reward you, never know. <laughs> by telling them, look here, there are solid monetary benefits here for you. So we have to learn, you know, the world works on incentives and disincentives. So we have to incentivize the lawyers also, you know, financially. Let's, let's also understand that. And perhaps, you know, at some time, I think we may have to, uh, you know, I do it sometimes. I tell clients, look, you've got a huge matter. You've got a huge matter. Now make very sure that you pay your lawyers adequately for a second. Don't let them scuttle this. I tell them openly. I'm sharing a secret. I tell them quite openly. So there you are, you know, there is the horse, there is the pond. Come on, yeah, it's our business to make that pond look nice. Okay, over and out. Good, sir. Uh, now, just a uh, just follow up, a natural follow up, a corollary to this question that I asked first. And from what both of you answered, uh, given the fact that the legal training that we get in our law schools is completely adversary, now, how important do you think? in the context of uh, mediation now uh, having become a legislated reality, how important do you think it is for lawyers to get trained in mediation advocacy? Like, because there is a, from how I see it, I think there's a totally different uh, framework of the mind that you need when you approach mediation from what you do, the way you think when you do a litigation. So how, how important do you think that training is? Laila? Absolutely, Jawad, uh, because it is a different hat. And cognitively, they have to come to recognize that what they do in mediation is different to what they do in litigation. Yeah. They, they need to learn both skills. And I, I would say it, it has to be advocacy in mediation is uh, uh, should be a compulsory subject because many of them, the law students coming out today, many of them, when they come into the profession, will be participating more as advocates in mediation first 
and then move into being mediators later. So, uh, Mr. Panchu, would you like to add? Yeah, I mean, I won't say anything about training because Laila is the queen of training. And I can't press into that area, not doing anything. But I will say that we should actually also build up mediation advocacy as a profession. We should tell lawyers, you know, here is a new avenue waiting for you. If you um, take training in mediation advocacy, if you study it, <clears throat> if you adapt yourself to it, you know, think differently, behave differently in the mediation, you actually will have a very successful practice avenue in front of you. And you'll be one of the first in it. And clients may seek you out saying, well, you know, this is a lawyer who can take me to mediation and help me. So I think we should actually build it up as a branch of the legal profession. I think that's very important from what both of you said, because I have a lot of students asking me this question. Uh, how would a career in mediation look like if we choose to you know, opt for it? So I think that's uh, one of the important things to explain to them is that mediation advocacy is something they can, that they can start off with uh, until they're mature enough to become mediators. Now, and Jawad, I would say in our competitions, there should be marking for the advocacy yes. in mediation. Yes, exactly. Yeah, right. And uh, I now I guess as the queen of training, Jawad, you are the king of competitions. <laughs> and and, and uh, Sri Ram, you are the founder of it. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm Maverick, that's all I am. <laughs> that, that, I know you in these other avatars as well, Sri Ram. <laughs> <laughs> so just coming back to this, uh, see now the act is, uh, you know, giving a time limit of 120 days which can be extended by another 60 days. Do you think that this is important to have such a uh, you know time restriction on mediations? Or do you think that this will be very restrictive because it all depends on how much time parties and lawyers and mediators find to be able to attend mediations. And supposing because of some delay, it gets extended, not because of any wanton uh, uh, you know attempt on anybody's part to delay. Do you think that it is important to have this or is it going to prove to be very restrictive to the creativity that goes into play in mediation? Who are you asking? I think uh, you you can also answer, sir. And uh, after that, Laila can. Uh, see, I think... I actually don't like the restriction, but I see the value of it because it helps to keep things on track. Otherwise, we lose sight of the mediations and, you know, people don't pick it up and don't post cases. Um, so I think it's, it's, it can be useful. Uh, I frankly think, you know, that no judge is going to deny a settlement just because it's crossed 180 days. So that I'm not really so concerned about. If parties are at it and if they settle and it's taken them 60 days longer, nobody is going to say, you know, this is not a bad, it's not a proper settlement. So it doesn't worry me at all. Okay. What do you think, Laila? I'm not comfortable with it. Because, uh, well, when there is limitation involved, um, or there is any mandatory element involved, yes. But otherwise, I think this is a carryover from the Arbitration Act. Where the judge is deciding. He can drag his feet. He can charge heavy fees. This is self-determination. Any party at any moment can terminate. Our law provides for it. Then why are you restricting such parties? And this is negotiation. There are some times you have to prepare for the negotiation. Um, I have often said this uh, you know, on several platforms. There was one case where the artist father died, bequeathing a lot of very valuable paintings to his wife and son. Dispute arose. The paintings had to be valued. It had to be sent to sent abroad for valuation. It took about seven, eight months. Can it be mediated? Or family, we want mediation to happen at the very onset of conflict. Families, disputes arise, 
because they want time. Deceleration is the theme in mediation. And I don't think we should limit it. Even matrimonial, allow them time. It's very important. So I, I, I'm not comfortable with it. Java, there's a simple way out. When you're nearing 180 days, just ask the parties to do a fresh agreement. Yeah, we can yes. do loopholes. Yeah. yeah, we can do loopholes. Yeah, I think that's, we, we can be very innovative there. <laughs> but why should we? I mean, as a legislation, yeah. why do we need it? Yeah, why to restrict? <clears throat> so, uh, what, what kind of matters? Because I think this is a question that uh, schedule uh, one creates a bit of confusion about this. So what kind of matters can be mediated, notwithstanding schedule one? And who can be appointed as a mediator in these matters? Laila, you can answer. <laughs> All civil disputes. Mm. All disputes can be mediated if um, and who can be the mediator. To me, process expertise is most important because you can always bring in domain expertise. A mediator who has process expertise knows how to bring in domain expertise. But domain expertise without process expertise would not be enough. Okay. The one I'm going to say, you know, in civil disputes, I mean, it's that broad. So it'll include commercial, commercial, yeah. matrimonial, consumer, real estate, construction, VIRA, a uh, whole lot of things. Um, they've left out the professional malpractice, which is not, they could have been, no need to leave that out. Uh, but I think also that we need to start looking at specializations in mediation. Uh, some people are very good at matrimonial mediation. There are others like me who are decent at commercial mediation, but hopeless at matrimonial mediation. So one, one should stay away, you know. We should start, I think, developing specializations. <clears throat> I agree with Laila that, you know, process uh, expertise is more important than domain expertise. Um, but we should also, I think, yeah, work creatively to select a co-mediator. I mean, if it's a complicated accounting matter, I might have a chart account with a co-mediator. And I think we should, you know, make it a point to induct youngsters as co-mediators. One thing we have fought for and succeeded, I think, is that in the rules, the age is going to be only 21. Because the point we made was, if you allow people to come only at 25 or 30, then we will lose their, we will lose them because they pass out of law school at 22 or something like that. Yes. And then if you have a gap, they will go somewhere else. You know, we will lose them. So we insisted that it should be 21 years only. I think we're going to succeed there. But we have to, as we senior mediators, have to make it a point to groom youngsters as co-mediators. I mean, it's part, I think, of our professional obligation to do that. And generally, in my experience, I've seen dealing with students that they are they are much, much better than us in when it comes to process expertise. I mean, they, they just adapt to it like fish yeah. to water. I mean, they're fantastic. They're I, fantastic. I, you know, I, I have a great deal of confidence in the next generation of mediators. Yeah. I think there's some sparkling, uh, wonderful talent out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Leila, this question is to you. Sorry. Yeah. 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 This question is to you. Now, uh, mediation proceedings are confidential, correct? Yeah. Are there any exceptions to this confidentiality? If yes, what are these exceptions and in what circumstances? And how does the mediator decide to disclose the information? So this is a very the sensitive issue. Yeah, the exceptions that I see are when there is an imminent threat, uh, um, to somebody or to the uh, public um, or domestic violence. These are the limitations uh, to uh, privilege. Limitations. Child, child privilege. abuse. Child abuse. No, child abuse also. Uh, domestic violence and child abuse. So these are the exceptions that uh, I have seen in the legislation. Um, yeah, threat to or plan to commit offense. Information on domestic violence and child abuse and imminent threat to public safety. 
So this is good, admissibility and privilege for this is good. But I'm still, uh, I, and I, I, I studied the other legislations like US, UK, Canada, uh, Singapore, all of them have these kind of limitations. Um, however, I'm not sure if this mentioning of domestic violence and child abuse as, a, um, as an exception to the privilege makes it a little porous because you already have threat to public safety or to any other person. Would this, now when I'm making an opening statement in a mediation, do I tell my parties about this, that allegations of domestic violence, because what I have is only allegations. I don't have a witness box. So allegations of um, of uh, um, domestic violence, I have no privilege on that. Should I say that? Yeah. I do understand if during a mediation, parties discuss a plan to put to plant a bomb somewhere, and two days later the bomb explodes, and the court will call me to give evidence. I do understand that. But when these things are allegations in front of me, what is my responsibility in the opening statement and in terms of privilege? I'm confused. I'd like to think about it. Um, Sriram, what are your thoughts on that? See, um, I don't think so much that it's a, it's a point about the opening statement. I don't think it's really an opening statement issue. Uh, in fact, I would not even mention it in the opening statement because the party is going yeah, to try to be very careful about you know talking this thing. Domestic violence, you know, it's a tough call. What is domestic violence? And you know, between uh, uh, these things, a tough call. And of course, with domestic violence, the, the the person who has suffered has has recourses to law, to police, to various things. It is child abuse where I would come down without exception. If I smelt child abuse, I would report it to the judge straight up. Without exception, because I do not put that child's future on my hands. I would tell the judge, I suspect something, you please do what you can now as a judge. Child abuse, no question. <clears throat> yeah. See, Sriram, in matrimonial cases, as many mediators who've done matrimonial mediation, would say that um, a large number of them will complain about child abuse and then agree to visitation and uh, all that. You, know, you have to go, you see, if you smell it, I'm not saying just because there are allegations. No. Yeah. If, but, you smell it, if you smell it in the air, then you act. So can we can we say here because uh, see th this is as Laila also said this is a bit of a confusing issue for a lot of mediators and this question keeps coming up all the time. Now is there a distinction between something that is ongoing like if the child abuse is ongoing or it is something or even the domestic violence for that matter or is it something that has happened in the past and the parties have now come to the mediation table to discuss how the relationship is going to be in the future. Now, if there ask, any distinction I, between... No, no, I'm sorry. I think you ask your conscience and you say, can I go to bed tonight if I don't act? So, um, it, this is a tricky area. Otherwise, I many of us not... I, I don't think it's tricky. I don't think it's tricky. I think you ask your conscience say, can I go to bed tonight if I don't do something about it? But that's why I ask it. In, in my... Um, <clears throat> you're right, Sridham. If, if it pricks my conscience, yes, even yeah. something which I really smell, then I sh I might either terminate the mediation. No, 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 sorry. Termination is not an answer. It's not an answer. Reporting what is it pre litigation. Reporting is a thing to determination, is not an answer. Sorry. Okay, what happens if it's pre No, we can't get over it by just saying I'm terminating the mediation. If you smell child abuse, you must report. Who do you report to if it's pre litigation? The court. The court. This is pre-litigation mediation. Whatever, then you, you, you find out some way, you know, we find out some way. But under the POXO Act, for instance, you have Posco, to... POXO, yeah, POXO, the POXO officer. So you're obliged to report. So you're obliged to report. 
So this, I, I don't know because many, um, it, it would be something which many mediators mm. would be concerned about. Another thing I was thinking of, I'm, I'm also thinking, how do you do this? In Singapore, uh, the privilege is uh, with permission of the court. That is not pre-litigation, that is it. Uh, so um, breaking the privilege, breaching the privilege is with the permission of the court. So I, I think this needs a lot more thought. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> my next question is to, uh, I would like Laila to start with this. What are your comments on schedules one and two of the mediation, 2023? Yeah. As Kiram earlier mentioned, uh, schedule one, I cannot understand why persons of unsound mind, um, high support needs for disabled people, deities, <laughs> minors are excluded from this legislation because they are the ones who need easy access to justice and legislations covering them have provided for very nuanced decision making. For example, first joint decision making in the Disability Act to the extent the disabled person can decide, he will decide and then bring in name somebody else who will help him to decide. So these are very nuance like under the mental health act should there be advanced directive the criminal procedure code has provided for it so why are we excluding them that is one question that i have to ask and uh, even the statutory authority i agree if it is for registration discipline and misconduct no mediation but very often this is combined with negligence, tortious liability, which is extremely good for mediation. Those are cases that have an instructive value. The, those mediations have instructive value. For example, in a case, one of the terms of settlement was the doctor goes for additional training. So you're losing opportunities to improve. I believe that there should be a clarification in that provision. Regarding Schedule 2, the Sexual Harassment Act, the Family Courts Act, and the Welfare of Parents Act. These are all legislations that require dialogue and conversation, <laughs> relationship side. What I agree, sexual harassment is a big offense. But majority of the sexual harassment cases are not being filed because people are reluctant about the exposure that the ICC brings in. So these are good cases. Similarly, um, the inquiry officers, the uh, parents and children, they don't need an inquiry officer initially. They, they would like mediation. The Family Courts Act, Section 9 of the Family Courts Act provides for a structure to be created but why not bring them under the, uh, the legislation as well, instead of overriding effect for their, those respective legislations? Section two is about the overriding effect. So I, I believe we need to relook at some of these things. I have only one comment. A lot of things the first schedule, they could have put it down. I will just said, save and accept with the permission of the court or tribunal having those that's all. We told them that. But I'm telling you, you know, drafting an act, sitting with government of India is a frustrating business. <laughs> we can have another session on that. So instead of a blanket prohibition, they could have... Uh, they could have put all this in just the same and accept the mutual report. I think yeah, that's right. Them, I think we don't know. What let, is let them appoint a guardian or let yeah. them, uh, you know, under the provisions of the act that are applicable to them. Yeah. Uh, sir, if, if five minutes, if more, five minutes. I can't take more than five minutes. Yeah. What? Well, one, one question to you, sir. If if you're comfortable, can I ask you this question? Now, regarding disputes against the government, uh, what are your comments on sections forty-eight and forty-nine of the Act, which restricted to only commercial disputes? You know, firstly, there's one huge mistake in forty-nine. Please read forty-nine. Has anybody got 49? 
Yeah. Yes, I have it. Just read that first sentence. You see what nonsense it is. Read the first sentence. Yeah, can I read it out? Read, read 49. Notwithstanding anything contained in this act, no dispute, including a commercial dispute, wherein the central government or state government or any of its agencies, public bodies, corporations, and local bodies, including entities controlled or owned by them, is a party. The settlement agreement arrived at shall be signed only after obtaining the prior written consent of the competent authority of such government or any of its entity or agencies, public bodies, corporations, and local bodies, as the case may be. So the, first is, the first sentence should have been notwithstanding anything concerned, in any case, yeah. not in no case. Yeah, but by saying no case, it make nonsense of that section. Yeah. It should be in any case where the government is a party, the settlement dispute can be a settlement can be entered to only after getting the sanction. Like that's an obvious mistake. Uh, see. There's a practical reality. <clears throat> the reason why government finds it difficult to settle in mediation is no government officer wants to take responsibility. Because in any settlement, you are giving up something. Yeah. You are getting a lot, but you're giving up something. The giving up of something can be used against you later in an audit, CBC, CBI investigation, prosecution, etc. So nobody wants to take a call. Uh, <laughs> so let's see, let's see. But I think 49 contains the seeds of this. Yeah. So I, like to I'm getting to be too much of a maverick. I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, but I think 49 contains the seeds of this. The government can create something, um, a procedure by which they can actually enable officers to settle. To settle. But uh, the act is deficient because it only allows government now to. Immediate commercial disputes. Commercial disputes. Exactly. There are so many other disputes, you know. Anyway, I hope that this is a start. Let's see if it comes to it later. So even in commercial disputes, I think there should be some kind of an uh, you know protection given to the officials who take of part. Course, of course, there should be. Definitely, there should be. Every case the government is settling, you must give protection, unless there is corruption. Yeah. Unless there is corruption, but you cannot say you know you cause loss to the public interest by giving up something. Yeah. Javad, anything else specifically for me? Otherwise, I have to take your leave. My throat is very bad. Uh, sir, if it is possible, just there are two questions. Then I'll go to Laila to elaborate further on that. One is about the mediation council. Because I've heard you expressing your reservations and a lot of us have these reservations about the composition. And I think that's something you also pointed out at the beginning. So what is your take on that, on the composition of the Mediation Council and also on the requirement of registration of mediators with the Mediation Council? Registration. Uh, second question is, uh, after that will be on the Singapore Convention because it is conspicuous by its absence in the new enactment. Yeah, so I'll answer both these quickly. Yeah. Uh, there definitely should be professional practicing mediators in the Council. So I think, you know, we should push See, this is only a beginning. It all depends how much we push. If we make enough of a noise that ministers will have to tell the secretary, look at these mediators are making my life difficult, you jolly well amend this act. It is as simple as that. We should push to have at least five, ten mediators on that. That's number one. Number two, registration of mediators. Yes, we should have registration. But we should make it easy, flexible, uh, uh, convenient. We should have very limited grounds for de accreditation. You know, serious misconduct, corruption, that kind of thing, limited grounds. But accreditation is good. Otherwise, any fellow will hang a shingle outside his house and say, I'm a mediator. Uh, what's the second? Singapore Convention. They, yep. that makes, it doesn't make sense for India. You you signed the convention in 2019 or when? 19, was it? Uh, pre yeah, 19. Right. 19. And then uh, you don't ratify it. I mean, how will you improve your ease of business? So it makes no sense for them not to uh, enact legislation, but maybe they will do it by you know separate standalone legislation. They could have done it, we gave them all the information. It makes no sense because we are unnecessarily depriving everybody of the message. Singapore is a very beneficial uh, convention. Yeah. So the earlier they do it, the better. 
So I think wherever we have found the act to be deficient, we don't have to sit quiet. We have to raise a ruckus. Democracy is all about shouting. Yeah. You raise a ruckus, you get heard and people act. As simple as that. Okay. Yeah. May I take your leave then? Yes, right. sir. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Yes. Throat Sorry, throat because throat. I really can't hold down anymore. It's getting. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Pleasure Thank to have you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Laila, can I request you to continue on those two questions about the mediation council? Because I think the registration of mediators is made optional. Do you think it should be made mandatory, number one? And the composition of the council, of course, is the next question, which Mr. Pancho has also answered. What are your views on that? And also on the Singapore Convention. Yeah. The, um, the definition of mediation is very wide. It includes registered mediators. That means it includes not registered mediators also. My only concern is when a settlement agreement can be enforced like a decree of the court, should we exercise more caution? Is any mediated settlement equivalent to a decree of the court? Will it be misused? Just to give enforceability to any agreement that people might enter into, you just bring somebody, some third person in, get him to authenticate and you have enforceability as the direct um, point. You, you can bypass specific performance and go in for enforceability. Would that be misused is my concern. Um, regarding the council, as Sri Ram said, we really battled to have people with mediation experience. From what I can see today, there's only one member who has knowledge of the law or mediation. And we all know that knowledge of the law or mediation is very different to the experience of mediation and understanding of the nuances of a topic like mediation. So to me, that council is really falling short of any mediation experience and mediation, uh, what do I say, the, the, the nuances of mediation. So do you think, said, let's uh, fight it. Just, just as a follow up on that, do you think it should be an elected body? Like, for example, we have the Bar Council of India. So it should be, we have various bar councils in different states. Do you think it should be uh, having a similar structure to that so that mediators play Why more? not? Why not? If, you know, just as I, um, about this, I, I, I was looking at that uh, privilege clause this morning. Why can't the mediator's privilege be as good as yeah. the attorney client privilege? Yeah. Because what we hear as mediators is far more often than what attorneys hear. So why should our privilege be any different? I don't think it's substantially different except for that uh, domestic violence and child abuse one. But anyway, similarly, if Bar Council is serving well with elected members, why not Mediation Council in India? So uh, I'll, I'll ask one more question to you, Laila, before I pass on to Sanjeev. Uh, now, in most jurisdictions, my understanding is that a mediator does not sign the settlement agreement. Correct me if I'm wrong. Now, this act requires the mediator to sign the settlement agreement. Now, what would be the effect of that? And can the mediators, tomorrow if there's a dispute, can the mediator call, be called as a victor simply because he or she has signed the settlement agreement? So, uh, Javad, I, I, will, I think this is coming from enforceability as a judgment or decree. In many countries, there is no enforcement like a judgment or decree. It's final and binding. So when you say judgment, decree, this may be one of those uh, fallouts of it. Yeah. You, you feel that it should be there? Well, since we've given it the status of a decree of the court, like the conciliation uh, is uh, arbitrator. Yeah. 
Transition Officer Science. Okay. So, Sajeev, uh, I have completed my questions. So, over to you now to give your I'm sure, uh, Dora, thanks. So, that was, uh, you know, one amazing session. And I'm sure uh, participants, uh, in addition, would have a lot more queries. But uh, we are looking at the paucity of time and also to kind of you know, make keep it very objective. Uh, I think we'll, we'll probably, you know, I mean, close it in a while. So, I'll quickly run through what we've heard. And, and, you know, hearing from, I would say, gurus of mediation, uh, you know, the kind of insight and the depth uh, of knowledge, which can surely come only from experience and like, you know, actually handing it on the ground. So, so that was amazing. And like, you know, a lot of different aspects of the, of the bill have been touched through and, uh, you know, the, the good parts and not, the, you know, not so good parts. So we, uh, as far as my take is concerned, probably I'm saying like, you know, let's look at it at half plus full even if the marks which have been received are 5 out of 10 or 6 out of 10. But at that way, you know, at the, at the beginning, I think it's a, it's a good beginning to start with. What is happening is we have given a legit, uh, you know, uh, recognition to a concept called mediation. Half of the time we were like, you know, I mean, struggling to tell the parties that units were real. It can make a difference. But people who were fence sitters, I would say, they have a reason to step in now because they have the legal sanctity, you know, behind it. So the, the very uh, terminology which people are, so used to it because of the conditioning of mind. It has the force of a judgment and a decree. Suddenly people are saying, yeah, now it's for real, right? So so if that be the case, at least it's, I would say, half the battle won. So, you know, a lot of acceptance by default can happen. Uh, people will be, uh, well, uh, had this been uh, mandatory? Yes, we heard that the pond has to be beautified. The pond has to be, uh, you know, really made attractive so that the horse is, uh, you know, lured in to walk and like, you know, I mean, quench his thirst, but would have been much easier if, if we were allowed to actually work on the pond, but the horse was by default coming because of the mandatory part. And as we keep saying at different forums, the, the mandatory part would not have meant that a settlement is mandatory. It was just as, as ma'am said, like, you know, the entry point. So you, you help people to try it out. You know, the people have not tried it out. Half the time we keep saying awareness, sensitization. So, it would have helped the cause. People would have been like, you know, more lured to it because it was a kind of a mandatory thing. One session, two session, you get a feel of it. You get a taste of it. You know, you go out eventually, but then next day you come back and say, yes, it makes sense, you know, because we, we, we got a taste of something different. So it could have been better, but then we, then we heard, you know, the institutionalization and the professionalism, the, 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 uh, you know, the force of decree and judgment and the, uh, uh, avoiding of the caging of mediation as a concept. So these were absolutely, you know, the positive points that Mr. Pancho said. Uh, yes, we had a debate on the MCI composition, uh, you know, the requirement of uh, mediators to be registered, but a lot will depend on like, you know, who mans the system. You know, I mean, do we, do we get succumb to any kind of a hierarchy or, a, you know, red tapeism or something? So from that perspective, I think the practitioners need to be there, need to be heard, need to kind of, you know, I mean, uh, you know, really make the required noise. First schedule, of course, is slightly lengthier, and uh, and and so is the second schedule, which probably uh, would mean that every particular statute, whichever is part of the second schedule, will not be overridden by the mediation. So you know, the mediation will keep happening, but in different ways and means, depending on a particular statute. So probably could have been avoided, but that's fine. And uh, coming back to the training, which requires a you know change in terms of the format, the design, the lawyers need to be encouraged to be part of the training part. That's important, I guess. Uh, and I, I think registration rules and all that we'll have to see because at times the devil lies in detail. So we'll have to really be uh, you know cautious about what kind of a detailing comes in. And, and and the last point, which probably I wanted to make was in terms of the time limit. Yes, we we did hear the views. So time limit on one side, we are making it voluntary and it's a self determination. So frankly, if you ask me till the time the parties are still willing to resolve and try it out, we are keeping them away from the litigation, away from the infrastructure, which is not adequate, you know, to treat them. So even after 120 and 60 days, if there's another 120 or another 60, I think we're still like, you know, I mean, trying something good for a noble cause. So even if they are not coming back, so unless it will, of course, you know, it's marked by limitation or there is something which requires adjudication and there's something urgent. Otherwise, the parties on their own, if they decide to continue, I think we should somehow uh, be flexible, accommodative, flexibility, which is the whole essence of mediation. 
So I think that's that's from my side. Uh, and and the last point which you are making is elected council. Uh, you know, the the elected council of mediator on the lines of bar council. I think that'll be that'll be great if we if we really kind of come together and we are able to impress you know the authorities to so be uh, maybe in 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 shorter course they can come out with these changes and i'm sure like you know the ranking of or uh, the numbers which have been received today 5 out of 10 6 out of 10 will improve to 7 and a half 8 or something and then over the period we will like you know keep improving so there's a lot of onus on us as well so i think that that's it so i think that was great and as a as a like, as a resolution professional i'm also looking at the application of mediation principles and uh, you know and and the features uh, and its application in IBC in in CRP in liquidation because we are having it is a kind of a commercial dispute it's kind of a workplace dispute and also a community dispute in a way so I think this prop this particular bill is going to also help uh, a lot of movement and a lot of action within IBC which is primarily the commercial dispute so with that I think. Uh, uh, yeah, we are good to kind of you know now put a closure to this and thanks. So, everybody. can we ask uh, Sanjeev, so, one, Sanjeev, Sanjeev, Sanjeev and Jawad, can we take some of the questions, a lot of at least some of them to uh, uh, you? Uh, can it be answered? A few of them at least. Okay, so uh, has anyone noted? So, probably you know, if we can throw up the questions one by one, depending on like you know who is uh, willing to answer, we can. Yeah, so I have I have one question for Lala, ma'am. So, ma'am, my question is how. Ma'am, my name is Ankit Jain. My question is regarding. Uh, so, how do you see mediation and ODR coming together? Well, it's provided for in the legislation. And if you look at ODR as virtual or uh, any other kind of online, the rules are there, everything is available and uh, what I think is positive is today online is possible, physical is possible, uh, hybrid is possible, any of these things are covered by the legislation. Um, <clears throat> may I ask a question? This is Mitsu from New Jersey, USA. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the enforcement of agreements arrived at uh, mediations conducted outside India? Well, um, we, we do have a problem now uh, unless it's conducted. Um, Jagrat, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? It's conducted outside, but it's conducted no, under no. the legislation. The territorial jurisdiction doesn't matter, but if it comes under the act, then it's uh, it's considered a domestic mediation. Am I right, Java? Absolutely. I think uh, the act doesn't deal with that. Laila. That is where I think the Singapore Convention yeah. comes into play. And uh, since the Singapore Convention has been completely uh, ignored by the act, if I may call it that, yeah. uh, the possibility of enforcing settlement agreements reached outside India is very remote now. And that is one of the biggest challenges we have with this particular act. Because unless and until the mediation takes place in India, right. uh, it's not enforceable. Right. But so territorial jurisdiction, Jawad, is not applicable. So you conduct a mediation outside, but the enforceability and it becomes a mediation under the uh, this act, which is a domestic mediation. Now, that is something that I think we need to examine a little yeah, more. We, we need to study that a little I, because study you that know, they provided for international mediation, yeah. but we really have not uh, explained how it's going to be. Right. But as and it's very the, difficult for state. mediators like us who are admitted as advocates in, in India and also practicing, you know, doing mediation abroad. Uh, it's very difficult for us. I would even go further to say that on the council, uh, we should elect. Uh, international members, at least one or two who are familiar with the subject and can help uh, push along the agenda. Yeah, yeah. Th these are all factors that have been suggested but overruled. <laughs> so currently the law actually says that the mediation should happen in India, even if one of the parties is like, you know, outside uh, India, that will be yeah. taken as an international mediation, but only from that perspective. But the the, the process has to happen in India to be under this uh, law. I think so that's where the enforcement will be there with regards to 
what is the logic behind it I, I'm not it's, in, sure. in this day and age it doesn't matter i do online right. mediations all that. does yeah. it matter really physical location uh, to the best of my knowledge territorial jurisdiction with mutual content uh, consent can be overcome or as you said virtual mediation is okay so even if the process is conducted abroad virtually it but it should be under the mediation act here complying with the requirements of our legislation uh, to the best of my knowledge i need uh, you know i need to study this more you mean on the lines of arbitration where there's a procedural law will be there substantive will be this but you know if if i read the section 2 which says this act shall apply where mediation is conducted in india in now india. that is where it becomes like you know very specific Yes. And, and I understand your view on the ODR part of it. You know, if it's online, then like, you know, how do you really, uh, you know, figure it out? But I'm sure government is thinking something because there's a lot of backlash with regards to the Singapore Convention thing. Yeah. So, if you were to address that eventually or in due course, I'm sure we'll have the answer. Uh, there would have been a lot of clarity if the Singapore Convention had been incorporated. Yeah. yeah. So this confusion would not have been there at all. True. Any other question? I have a question, please. Hi, Javad. So this is Inan again. We met earlier. Yeah. I So I have a twofold question. First, do you see mediation running into the same kinds of problems as arbitration did in India? And an extension of that, so do you think the Singapore Convention has been left out because of the experiences we've recently had in arbitration? So Vedanta, Antrix Devas, and all of these cases where the government really suffered national embarrassment. I mean, our properties were seized in Paris because of international awards being enforced. So could it could that have had an effect? In the decision, you know, it's entirely possible that that is what motivated the government to exclude the Singapore Convention from this act. It is possible, though we cannot uh, conclusively say that that was the sole factor that was behind this decision to exclude the Singapore Convention. Uh, but the question is whether it is a wise decision or not. Whether it really helps in the from the perspective of ease of doing business. whether it inspires confidence and uh, having already ratified the singapore convention i mean having signed the singapore convention what is the purpose of not ratifying it and not including it in the mediation act now these are all questions that you know uh, we can only ponder upon and discuss but it is for the government to ultimately answer what actually motivated the government to exclude this uh, from the purview of the act Now, as to the question whether this will run into the same kind of problems that arbitration has run into, it all depends on whether retired judges decide to monopolize mediation, or whether we are able to have strong institutions that would uh, resist this and give mediation the kind of uh, professional texture and context that it needs. Let's so, yeah. yeah, we have some very powerful institutions here. Laila herself is heading camp. so we have many institutions like this we have madhyam we have camp we have iiam so there are so many institutions which are quite well placed here but the uh, you know the, the 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 question is again the mediation council because how far the mediation council is going to support this uh, is another question so time alone will tell how this is going to work out so let's keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best So I think a better way to phrase this question would be: How do we prevent the same fate that arbitration suffered? And the answer is that to put up a strong defense, exactly. So that we know what the problems yes. are. Yes. So that is where it's important to set up the institutions, which we failed to do in arbitration. I can add to that. I believe this profession will succeed, or because it's self-determination. I believe this profession will succeed if we maintain. high standards in our profession if we all um you know really focus on how to improve our skills yeah. reflect this is a different kind of profession uh, uh compared to an adversarial uh, profession here is based on reflection self growth maintaining high standards so that we lure people into a self determination into a process where they can walk out any time it's only high standards so that's what we should be watchful about 
Uh, any other questions we have? May I just make one comment? Please go ahead. Yes, Mayor. Uh, I was just uh, having an interaction today morning with one of the principals of a law college in Mumbai. And uh, overall, the understanding of what ADR is, the concept of ADR itself is lacking. And uh, most people believe, or especially law students believe, even after graduation, the freshers think that ADR only refers to arbitration. Now, that has been my experience. Of course, everybody's experience may differ. But uh, and I, I've had discussions with uh, Jawad on this, and everybody is trying to create awareness. But I think more awareness is required about what mediation actually is and these competitions and the trainings that are conducted by camp and I'm trying to do it in my own small way. So I believe that this is still required and the requirement is going to increase more and more. So uh, I am looking actually for guidance and directions from all you torchbearers of mediation in India on how this can better be can be done in a better manner and how the scope can be increased to make it more inclusive. I think that, that's a very good point that Mihir has made. Just to add to that, what I feel, I mean, subject to what uh, whether Laila would agree with me and Sajji would agree with me and others, I feel that uh, mediation, one of the strongest points of mediation is self-determination. At the same time, it's also one of the weakest points because simply because mediations can conclude in no agreements at all. So they can remain inconclusive if parties are not able to reach an agreement. So therefore, uh, where I see mediation bringing in a lot of value is to have hybrid methods, you know, ARB, MED, med -ARB. So these are the ways in which, you know, if, if mediation fails, then what is the alternative? Or if mediation is partially successful and partially parties are not able to uh, reach agreements on certain issues. How do those issues get resolved? So I think this is where I think mediation should be the first option. After which, if it fails, if it doesn't work out, there should be other options also available. I think that's how it's going to work out ultimately in the future. Sure. Uh, just, just wanted to add here. Uh... Uh, Javad, can I add to that? I, yes. I do believe hybrid, hybrid is, is really good. Uh, but I still believe that self-determination is the best part of it. That should not be compromised. And if Under their decision is to not settle, that is self-determination. And you're right, we should provide options in the form of arbitration or other, uh, you know, if that's their choice. Um, yeah. I'm totally with you. In fact, I was about to say that, that normally what is happening is, from self-determination to a situation whereby we feel that the parties have not been able to agree to a situation or an amicable solution, I think a lot has to be blamed on the conditioning of minds. Because over the period, what has happened is we have started believing that a third party can decide for us what is good, what is right for us versus we on our own trying to be our own judge, right? Which means that, you know, I mean, you need to be in that position. Uh, you know, have that confidence and conviction where exactly the role of a mediator would be very, very important in terms of, again, apart from being process expert, he really needs to, you know, give a proper nudge and help and handhold, whether during caucus or separately to try and give them the confidence that, guys, it's your concern, it's your issue, what is to be given, what is to be taken is something what nobody better than you who, who you know, needs to decide this. So it's all, I think, a lot of conditioning has to be unconditioned. So a lot of learning and learning will happen together. And and, and that's where, uh, you know, Meher also said, all of us, everyone, torchbearers and people like us who are learning by the day, we have to, like, you know, be going further deeper into it and try and make it uh, application as wider as possible. So awareness and sensitization to me is, I mean, we've been saying for, for a long, like in for the last five, seven, eight years, I've been hearing this. But I think there's a lot of ground to be covered on that. So, yeah. I think, Sajiv, uh, you, you're absolutely right over there. So what I do normally in my mediations is I tell the parties, look, you are in the seat of power today. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and You have the power to decide how this is going to go. 
Agreed. Now, if you leave this table and walk away, you're going to be losing that power. Now, you choose whether you want to use that power or you want to give it to somebody else. Absolutely. And invariably, it works. It, it does. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So, I have another commitment. So Yeah, uh, ma'am, we are done. We are done, I guess. So, I think we had all the questions and, uh, and, and if there are some which are left or people are still thinking, I think we'll keep it for the next session. Yes. We'll have, you know, uh, more, more sessions like these, I'm sure. But thanks a lot. So, Thank you, uh, ma'am, and uh, thank you, Jabad. Thank, thank you, ma'am. So, yeah. thank you, Jabad. Thank you, uh, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Take care.